Greetings to one and all. Welcome to Physio TV session. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Kailash Patil, sir. Sir is a consultant in joint replacement at sport and sports injury surgeon at Sanchiti Institute for Orthopedics and Sunshine Clinic, Pune. Sir is a fellow reconstruction surgeon at Catherine Hospital and Sports Clinic, Pune, Germany. He is an assistant professor in orthopedics at Sanchiti Institute for Orthopedics and Rehabilitation. Sir has completed his graduation from Dr. D.Y. Patil Medical College, Kolhapur and post-graduation in Diploma in Orthopedics from Sanchiti Institute for Orthopedics. He is a DNB from National Boards of Examinations, New Delhi and a member of National Academy of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Sir has done various international fellowships and training. He's a Ranavat Fellow at Hospital for Special Surgery, New York, USA, and a Fellowship of, uh, of the European Society for Sports and Surgery of the Knee. He's a member of various international societies, just to name a few. He is a member of the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons and the Magellan Knee Society member Europe, and a member of Indian Arthroscopic Society, IAS. Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and Indian Orthopedic Association. He's been a faculty in various international conferences such as the Ranavat Orthopedic Conference in 2014, 15 and 2017 and member of Indian societies such as the Indian Arthroscopic Society 2013, Pune Arthroscopic Course and Pune Knee Course in 2016-17. He has eight publications in international journals, such as the Journal of Orthopedic and Trauma, Journal of Arthroplasty, Journal of Arthroscopy, and Indian Journal of Arth Orthopedics. With this, I would like to hand over the session to you, sir. It's an honor to have you on Physio TV channel. Uh, thank you, and it's an honor to be on Physio TV, and thank you, Dr. Sabaral, for such an elaborate uh, introduction of uh, uh, myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Kailash Patel. As uh, I'm working as a uh, consultant orthopedic and knee surgeon at Sancheti Institute for Orthopedics and Rehabilitation. So today, uh, my talk is really uh, going to be about a very common uh, topic uh, regarding the knees, and that is arthritis. Now, this arthritis uh, is 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 a very vast subject where we uh, have to divide it into whether it is an osteoarthritis, whether it is rheumatoid arthritis, whether it is gouty arthritis, and we can name about about 40 arthritis types, different types. So whenever a patient asks, to, Doctor, what kind of arthritis do I have? So we cannot say, generalize the topic on arthritis that you have osteoarthritis, but we have to investigate and see whether the patient really has osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or gouty arthritis, and depending upon that, our, we decide our treatment modules. So uh, to uh, to be very specific, about 80 to 90% of the patients which come in the OPD, they are going to be osteoarthritic patients. Now, uh, what is osteoarthritis? Is osteoarthritis is basically uh, the degeneration of the joints, and that happens because of majorly because of age. It is an age-related degenerative change where uh, because of the wear and tear of a joint, the joints start uh, losing their lubrication. They will start losing their uh, coating which is called as the cartilage and uh, they also start getting damage to their meniscus that is the cushioning of the knee and the ligaments also of the uh, knee and so on and so forth. So that is what happens in osteoarthritis. Uh, now osteoarthritis uh, per se along with it we also see patients of rheumatoid arthritis which is the second most commonest uh, arthritic group uh, we see amongst the patient and now rheumatoid arthritis is basically a, a, a disease which has uh, what we call as rheumatoid arthritis factor in the blood uh, which can give rise to this kind of arthritic change. Um, now this is a little different from what we see in an osteoarthritic patient because osteoarthritic patient usually the joints which are affected are the knees, the hips or the ankles but in rheumatoid arthritis what happens is it's a generalized disease. So most of the joints, uh, small joints of the hand, uh, the hip joints, the knee joints, um, along with that, uh, it ha also has some systemic uh, uh, effects uh, which can uh, affect uh, your generalized um, architecture of the body itself. Uh, this is in osteoarthritic where a specific joint is affected. Now, uh, 
now coming back to osteoarthritis uh, osteoarthritis can be because of degenerative changes it can be because of a previous trauma to the knee it can be because of a uh, 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 injury inside the knee uh, in your younger ages like a ligament tear or a meniscus tear or a cartilage defect which we which has been neglected over a period of time and that gives rise to uh, the progression of uh, this arthritic disease now uh, what we really come to know about osteoarthritis is I would just like to show you how a normal knee looks. So if you look at the normal knee, can you see? Yeah. Yes. So a normal knee usually is like this. This is the thigh bone. This is the leg bone. Now this is what the blue thing which you can see is called as a cartilage. And this white thing which you can see is called as the meniscus of the uh, knee. And the side ligaments, these are the ligaments of the knee. So these are called as the collaterals. Now if you open the knee, you can see uh, these white structures inside the knee. These are uh, called as uh, the cruciate or the cruciate ligaments. These are two in number, one in the front and one at the back. So this in general gives stability to the knee, a general architecture of the knee. Now this is all covered by a capsule and this also has something called as a lubricating fluid, which we usually call it as synovial fluid. Now what happens in osteoarthritis is over a period of time, this cartilage or this blue thing starts getting worn off it starts getting eroded. It's just like uh, a paint getting peeled off. And over a period of time, uh, this progresses through various phases. Now, if you put the phases, if you limit those phases, we can do it in four phases. That is phase one, phase two, or the uh, type one, type two, type three, and type four. So in type two and three, most of the cartilage is worn out. And in type 4, along with the cartilage whereof, there is a lot of bone defects and uh, there can be uh, damage to the ligaments also. And the knee becomes highly unstable and painful. So uh, if we go according to that, this is called as the Kellegrin and Lorenz classification of knee arthritis, knee osteoarthritis. Now what happens is along with this degeneration or peeling off of the cartilage, there is also because of the rubbing of the bone against each other, there are a lot of pieces of bone or uh, small little uh, uh, parts of bone which come off, which are called as osteophytes. And these can get collected inside the knee or, or around the knee. And these can cause what is called as limitation of movement or range of motion is limited in such cases. And that can lead to uh, your uh, loss of movement of the knee. Uh, now, that is one aspect of osteoarthritis. The second most common aspect is the pain. Because your cartilage gets worn off, your meniscus gets worn off, the nerve endings which are there inside the knee, they get irritated and that causes a lot of pain and inflammation. That is the swelling of the knee. Along with this, the third thing which happens in osteoarthritis is uh, your fluid which is there inside, the liquid which is there, it has a certain viscosity and it has a certain thickness to it. Just like we put oil inside a vehicle or something and it is over a period of time that uh, that fluid gets uh, starts getting losing its viscosity, starts losing its stickiness and that gives rise to watery like substance inside which is, gets collected and which has less um, uh, uh, resistance to uh, friction inside the knee and that causes a lot of uh, inflammation inside the knee. Now this can also lead to a lot of pain inside the knee and it can also lead to swelling inside the knee. Now, along with these, the fourth factor which comes in osteoarthritis is deformities. Deformities is your knee never stands straight after uh, osteoarthritis. Over a period of time, it starts getting bent in one position. So, uh, most of the time, what we call as a varus knee. Varus knee is bow legs. In, in, in talking terms, it is something which people say that, doctor, I have got bow legs. So, bow legs is bending of the knee outwards. And exactly this, the, exactly the opposite of, of this happens in rheumatoid arthritis, where the knees start getting bent inside the knee. They are also called as bow legs, but the architecture is a little different from osteoarthritis. Exactly opposite of what happens in osteoarthritis. The osteoarthritis, the knees start getting bent outwards, and in rheumatoid arthritis, they get start bending bending inside. So most of the times, this is what happens in, these are the commonest, I'm talking about rheumatoid and osteoarthritis because these are the commonest patients which we are going to see in our day-to-day -day OPD. And uh, uh, coming to the treatment portion of this. Now, uh, if we are going to treat these patients, most of the patients, when they start having knee pain, it is usually post their 40s or post their 50s that they are going to have knee problems or knee issues, which in the end, 
they basically uh, come to a doctor to see a doctor with, with, because the knee starts getting having a lot of pain. They are having difficulty in walking. At times, we also have patients who have had a locking of the knee. That is, the knee get, it gets stuck up in one position and it, it is not at all free. So these are the commonest symptoms which we see in these patients. Along with this, when the degenerative changes start happening, there, can, there, there is a secondary mechanism of protection inside the knee, which is called as the meniscus or the cushionings of the knee. Now, uh, in these patients, the because your mechanics of your knee change, uh, a lot of loading happens over the knee. And at times, because of this uneven loading and uneven walking of the patient, you can have a damage to the meniscus also. And that is the time when we common, commonly see what we call a degenerative meniscal tears. And that can suddenly give rise to increase in the amount of pain which the patients are having. So if you look at an x-ray of a patient uh, who doesn't really have any kind of uh, radiological changes in the knee, uh, suggestive of osteoarthritis, but the pain is having a lot of, lot of pain. So that is the time and the patient also fits in that age group. So we uh, at times also need to get an MR scan of that knee because we need to know whether the patient is having any other problem with the knee other than osteoarthritis. Because then if you look at the x-ray, osteoarthritis is basically an x-ray diagnosis. So if you look at the x-ray and if the x-ray is looking fine, uh, we can just go and see if we can get anything over the MRI, where we do something called as a uh, MRI of the soft tissue or the meniscus or the ligaments we can, we can see. At times, we also order for something called as a cartilage map. Cartilage map is to see how much amount of cartilage is remaining, how much is the thickness of that cartilage and whether it is getting degenerated or whether it is getting damaged. And that is the time when we order for an MRI. Now, the second indication where we order these MRIs are uh, uh, in cases where we are planning for uh, what we now call as unicondylar knee replacements or uh, a high tibial osteotomy, where we change the axis or the alignment of the knee at times. Now, these are the patients where uh, who come to us with a lot of pain in the early age group. Now, if a patient is beyond 50s, beyond 55 or 60s, we can very well go ahead and do a total knee replacement or a changing of the whole cartilage of the knee. But in cases where the patients come in early, but they still have uh, arthritic pain, uh, we do an MRI, we do an X-ray, special X-rays are done, and then we see whether only your knee per se, if you look at it, is a tri-compartmental knee. It, it has three compartments. So if you look at the knee, there is this is the medial compartment, this is the lateral compartment, this is the medial compartment, and there is a patella about this, which is the third compartment. Now we have to see whether the patient is having arthritis of lateral, arthritis of the medial, or the patellofemoral compartment. Depending upon that, we nowadays can offer a... a a catered kind of uh, replacement surgery or a surgery option per se. Now, in very early cases, young patients who are high demand and who are uh, rather the working population uh, like farmers or workers or laborers, in, the, in those cases where a knee replacement in early age group is not really an option, we can offer something called as a high tibial osteotomy or we change the axis of the knee and offload that portion of the knee which is getting degenerated. So that is changing of the axis of the knee. So we cut the knee at two places. One is in the femur and one is at the tibia or the bone below or the shin bone. And then we change the axis of the knee. If it is in varus, we change it into valgus. So that is what we do usually in cases of high tibial osteodomies. Now, uh, coming to the treatment options in cases of osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis per se, uh, in cases of osteoarthritis, there are two treatment options. One, which we call as a non-operative treatment option, where we uh, uh, give the patient uh, something which is most important and which I do in most of my patients who come to my OPD, uh, say about 70% of these patients get better with it and that is called as physiotherapy, the, all the exercises of the knee. And that increases, uh, that helps the knee in three ways. One is increases the strength of the knee Second, it increases the blood supply of the knee. And third, it also lubricates the knee to some extent so that it can move freely. So it offers a range of motion to the patient and the patient feels free in the knee. 
because in osteoarthritis or any kind of arthritis, what happens is usually uh, because of the inflammation, because of the pain and because of the rubbing of the cartilage, the range of motion becomes very less and the patient feels that the knee is catching or the knee is getting stiffer by the day. So all these things are taken care of with physiotherapy. So that is the first option which we offer the patient whenever a patient comes with early arthritis or say stage one, stage two arthritis. Uh, now, the second option is in most of the cases, we see nowadays that most of the patients who are arthritic because of their pain and because of uh, their age, they cannot be walking too much or they cannot have too much of exercise and they become obese. So we ask them to lose weight to some extent because if you look biomechanically, what happens is 70% of your body weight, 70% of your body weight is taken by your knees and that is why your knees degenerate really fast. And that is why we ask them to reduce the weight. So if you calculate the uh, BMI of a patient, that is uh, body mass index of a patient. So we have to have a body mass index of around say 15 to 20. And if the patient sits in that, then it is quite possible that the pain might reduce, which the patient's knees are taking. And that is the second treatment option which we offer. Now, the third one which we come is the change in the lifestyle. That every day walking, every day, uh, their uh, lifestyle, how they are going to do about go about it. And we ask just four things from them. One is they are not supposed to squat. They are not supposed, second is not supposed to sit cross-legged because in Asian population, not only Indian, but Asian population, cross-legged sitting is one of the biggest uh, 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 sitting postures which the patients or any of, the, of us are used to, or basically we are taught to sit in that position, whether we are praying, whether we are eating, whether we are doing something else, we are going to sit in that cross-legged position. And that increases the amount of pressures inside the knee to a lot of extent, say about 10 times than what they are expected to be inside the knees. And that can also lead to a lot of degeneration inside the knee. So the second thing which we ask them is not to sit cross-legged. Now, the third thing is we ask them not to go up and down the stairs too many times, because what happens is, uh, your stairs, uh, they have to have a certain height where your knees can really take that much amount of pressure inside the knee. So whenever you're climbing a stair, the amount of pressures inside the knee, they also increase and the amount of work the muscles have to do in order to uh, pull the body up or get the body down is also very high. And as I said, 70% of the knee body weight is taken by your knees. And when you climb a stair, that 70%, only one knee, because we climb one step at a time. So one knee has to take that much amount of weight. Suppose if you are a 100 kg fellow, your, the knees are going to take 70 kgs of weight. So that is support, that is as far as possible avoided. And if it is unavoidable, because at times patients stay in houses where there are no lifts, there are too many stairs. So at that times we ask the patients just to hold the railing of the stairs and then pull themselves up rather than pushing themselves with the knees. So that is one thing. And the third thing which we ask is uh, how they go for their uh, toilets. So if you ask, uh, if you see most of the houses in India now, if you see in the rural population, so most of the houses are having Indian toilets where they have to sit completely on their uh, knees and they have to squat down. And that is the time when your knees are under a lot of pressure. And then uh, if an arthritic knee or a patient with arthritis has that uh, issue that they cannot uh, have a, a Western commode. So that is the time when the knees start degenerating really fast and uh, to a lot of extent. So we ask them to use uh, Western commodes as far as possible so that the knee pressures are reduced. So these are the four basic things which we ask the patients not to do in cases of early arthritis or when the patient is having arthritis. Now, uh, coming to the third, fourth portion of the treatment modalities, is medications. Now, medications help to a certain extent in the, in the sense that if you are going to give uh, uh, painkillers, uh, that will give a momentary relief to the patient and that will also relieve the patient or a feel-good factor also comes to the patient that they are ha not having the pain and they can do their daily activities. But painkillers can be given up to a certain extent. They cannot be given for years together and that might uh, lead to uh, damage to your uh, certain organs like your kidneys or liver. So we cater as per the patient's need, the painkillers are given. And according to that, 
uh, uh, once the pain settles down, we, uh, you know, taper down the dosages of the medications. Now, the second type of medications which most of the doctors prescribe is uh, supplements like calcium, like glucosamine, uh, like uh, boswellia, all these things, nutraceuticals. So, all these things do help uh, to a certain extent in getting the knee a little flexible than what it is. Uh, it reduces the amount of inflammation inside the knee also. And also, uh, it is not proven, but yes, uh, to a certain extent, uh, there are reports which say that glucosamine helps in building up the cartilage, but it is not proven. But we uh, do give them because they do cause no harm. So if they're not, not causing harm, if they're not helping, they might, uh, uh, they also don't cause any harm. So they might help to a certain extent. Now, the fourth thing is in cases who come to us with arthritis, they are of an older age group and a lot of times they're having a little bit of osteoporosis also. So supplementary calcium should be given along with vitamin D and that should help. Also, along with it, sometimes we do offer giving them some kind of a topical um, application like uh, an ointment or, uh, or an oil which will help to uh, relieve that topical pain of the patient. And also the patient also gets some kind of a little bit of massage, which increases uh, the blood supply to that portion of the body. Now, uh, coming to the fourth portion and uh, the fifth way of treating these patients is at times in grade one and grade two patients, uh, probably we might give them some kind of an injection inside the knee, which can pull on for some time. Now, these are two types of injections. One, is a steroid injection which gives immediate relief to the patient and uh, 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 patient feels uh, much better after the injection. But that might uh, be for a certain amount of period. It's not going to be a permanent solution. Now, these steroids act in two ways. One is they relieve the amount of pain, they re reduce the amount of inflammatory mediators in the inside the knee. And second, the all inflammation which is already there, they also help in reducing it. The swelling is reduced. And the patient is much better after that and we can pull on. Suppose a patient comes to you in the age group of 45, 50, 45 to 50 and you want to delay the uh, surgical option given to the patient, we can definitely give these injections. Now, the second type of injection which the patient, uh, which we offer the patients is what we call as a hyaluronic acid. Now, hyaluronic acid is basically an ingredient of your normal fluid which is there inside the, uh, the body, uh, inside the joints, that is the synovial fluid. Now, it is a component of the synovial fluid which is called as hyaluronic acid. Now, these injections or rather in talking terms, what we call as gel injections or lubrication injections. So, these are also helpful to a certain extent. So, these can be given over a period of time. Suppose, say, uh, you can give uh, three to five shots to a uh, patient uh, over a period of, say, three months to six months. And uh, that they do help uh, to a certain extent, just like your steroids. But uh, both these options are temporary. They are not going to be a permanent solution. So over a period of time, suppose a patient comes to you in stage three and stage four. Now there are two ways to decide whether a patient is going to be offered a re uh, replacement surgery or uh, not, a, not any kind of a surgery. Now one is how much the pain the patient has one thing, second thing is how much deformity the patient has and how much day-to-day -day activities are hampered because of this. Uh, these two things. So of uh, depending upon the pain profile of the patient, if the patient has too much amount of pain, then yes, and the patient wants a one-time solution. Doctor, I need to get rid of this once and for all, then yes, there is an option which is the total knee replacement or a partial knee replacement. As I mentioned earlier, a partial knee replacement is a compartmental replacement surgery. That is, it depends on what compartment of your knee is damaged or what compartment of your knee is degenerated. And depending upon that, we do what is called as a medial compartment arthroplasty, a lateral compartment arthroplasty, or a patellofemoral arthroplasty. So depending upon that, we do these surgeries. Now, coming to in most of the cases, most of the cases where we call as tricompartmental arthritis, so tricompartmental is all the three compartments of the knee are involved. So that is called as com uh, tricompartmental. So if you look, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. So if you look at this, this is a normal knee. This is the thigh bone. This is the leg bone. This is the cartilage, which I mentioned earlier. Now, as the age advances, all this gets damaged. So all the cartilage is lost. The menisci are lost. The ligaments have become loose. And that is when we offer these patients 
as a knee replacement surgery. So if you look at the uh, the X-ray picture. So if you look at the X-ray picture, uh, X-ray picture often normally looks like this. And as the age advances, the knee becomes more and more damaged. So if you go in the third and the fourth stage, so we offer what is called as a total knee replacement or a tricompartmental replacement. So total knee replacement is not really a knee replacement. That is, we are not going to remove the whole knee and put in a new uh, new knee there. So we, it is basically what we call as a surface replacement surgery. So surface replacement surgery means that we are going to remove whatever damaged part is there inside and we are going to put on caps or we are going to put on these kind of a replacement components on that. So these are just like a cap. So if you compare it, so it's evolved from what we started as a, from dentistry. So what we do is usually we put caps on the tooth if they are aching. So it's similar to that. So we put caps on the knee. One is above, that is on the femoral bone, that is the thigh bone, and one is below, that is the tibia or the lower portion of the knee. And there is something called as a polyethylene or the portion which is there inside in between these two. So this is called as a this is called as a knee replacement surgery. So this is what we usually do. Now there are two types of knee surgeries. One is a conventional total knee replacement, which we have been doing since 50 odd years and which has been working quite fine. So uh, that is one thing. And now the newer innovation which has come is what is called as a robotic total knee replacement. So what is the difference between a conventional total knee replacement and a robotic? knee replacement one in conventional knee replacement what we do is we use certain kind of jigs which are available which we use to take the cuts or removing the cartilage which is damaged from the knee and for that we have to use the whole of the uh, uh, inside or the intramedullary canal uh, we have to open in cases of robotic knee replacement what happens is the robot predecides what amount of bone has to be re removed how much amount of bone has to be removed and that leads to reduced uh, amount of incision that is reduce, leads to reduced amount of uh, exposure of the soft tissue and also it reduces the amount of bone which is going to be cut. Now, in both the cases, in, in hands of a trained surgeon, in a hands of a trained arthroplasty or a replacement surgeon, uh, it is less likely that there are any errors going to be happening both with conventional and robotic surgery. But the amount or the percentage of uh, errors which are going to happen with the robotic surgery are much more less than a conventional totally replacement in hands of a newer arthroplasty surgeon. Those who are trained in it, that is okay. But in cases of a newer arthroplasty surgeon, robots do help. Now, in the second thing about robotic knee replacement and conventional knee replacement is conventional knee replacement has a little bit, say about 10% uh, higher uh, chances of uh, getting delayed in the rehabilitation as compared to a robotic knee replacement. But if you look at the literature, if you look at, if you go through the papers which have come out regarding conventional versus robotic, there is not much of a difference. Both of them do quite well uh, over a period of time. But if you want, we can uh, do a robotic replacement. But usually I offer robotic knee replacements in patients who are having severe amount of deformities. In cases where uh, there are uh, there are previous fractures, in cases where there are previous implants inside the knee. Now, in these cases, robotic replacement does uh, offer a better uh, value for uh, your uh, surgical uh, option. Uh, but in regular knees, uh, conventional uh, total knee replacement also does the same job as a robotic knee replacement. Now, these are the two types of knee replacements of a total knee replacement. Now, in cases of uh, unicondylar knee replacements, like I said, either a medial condyle or a lateral condyle, that, that means if you have to replace one portion of the knee, so that you can uh, just replace the amount of knee which is uh, amount of knee which is damaged. Suppose if this compartment is damaged, so we can do this compartment. If this compartment now in these cases, robotics does have offer a better value. Uh, rather than a conventional because this requires a lot of precision and that is offered by robotic knee replacement. So that is one thing. Now, uh, coming to uh, uh, after the knee replacement, what is the protocol after the knee replacement? Now, what we have is we have a very, very good, well-trained uh, group of physiotherapists with us who have been very well-trained with these 
knee replacement protocols, knee replacement, post knee replacements, uh, physiotherapy protocols. And uh, most of our patients, I'm happy to say that most of our patients, now there are two things which we usually used to tell the patients that you're not supposed to squat, you're not supposed to sit cross-legged uh, after the knee replacement surgery. That is the two things which usually, and the patient, most of the patients are taken aback that I won't be able to sit cross-legged because that is one of the uh, daily chores which the patient usually uh, is used to. Now, I'm happy to say that because of our physiotherapy protocol and because of our physiotherapists, most of our patients are able to sit cross-legged and they, uh, even after a knee replacement surgery. Thanks for that to all our physiotherapy team and the physiotherapy college, which, uh, which is taking out so many good physiotherapists with us. So what I usually tell my patient is my job is for the day of the surgery itself. Previous to the surgery and after the surgery, your physiotherapist is the main doctor who is going to cater to your daily requirements and your daily physiotherapy protocol. So we usually offer two things. One is we ask them to have a physiotherapist who is going to supervise their uh, uh, exercise protocols post the surgery at least for one, one and a half month. And once the patient is comfortable and when we see the patient is doing quite well, uh, we ask the physiotherapist uh, to, to be discontinued and they can do it on themselves. But if not, then they can uh, continue the physiotherapy protocol for a, a month or two more. One thing. Second thing, we also offer in Sancheti per se, we are also offering what we uh, what we call as a home protocol. Where uh, Now, I was uh, trained in the US and US has a step-down unit in every hospital where the patient or the rehab unit where the patients are usually made to do the exercises, getting admitted, staying admitted in a step-down unit. Now, we don't have those facilities in India per se. So what we have offered in Sanchet itself is the first of its kind that we offer uh, a home physiotherapy uh, uh, guide. And for that, we have a website also and a group of physiotherapists are with us. Uh, we call it the Helios or the Helios group where uh, you can directly contact with the uh, with the uh, website and get a physiotherapist at your home and they can do the physiotherapy at home. So these are the home services which we offer, uh, which also offers your stitch removals, your dressings. So the patient doesn't have to travel up and down the hospital because in Sanjeti, we get patients from everywhere, from abroad, from India. And it's difficult for the patients to travel every time to the hospital. So we offer these home services also. So that is one of the things which I would like to emphasize uh, uh, with the uh, uh, with Sanjeti Hospital uh, knee replacement uh, unit as well as hip replacement unit. So uh, that's about what I would like to share about arthritis and total knee replacement and uh, robotic total knee replacement. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your time and your suggestions regarding physiotherapy post total knee replacement as well. Thank you. Thank you.